Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Lowell's First Congregational United Church of Christ. Thank you for springing forward this morning. <laughs> to those of you who made it here, we're, we're a small but mighty crew today, um, but I'm glad we're together. Some announcements this morning. Uh, first, uh, there, as always, is a need for volunteers to keep things running here uh, in worship, and we have a need for sound and Zoom volunteers. So if you are interested in volunteering to do sound or Zoom, uh, contact Pastor Alyssa or myself uh, to let us know. On March 22nd, there is going to be a women's walk, a women's history walk in downtown Grand Rapids. And a group of us will be going down there together. Uh, so anyone who is interested, uh, who wants to join us, please let Emily Elms know. And uh, Emily will make sure to sign you up uh, so that we can all go together. There is also a need for volunteers uh, for the mobile food pantry on March 25th from 8.15 to 11.45 in the morning uh, at From. So if you are able to help with that, March 25th, uh, be at From for the mobile food pantry. Uh, and you can sign up by the front doors of the sanctuary here in the building. Uh, also, watch the newsletter for upcoming um, announcements about Lent and services in the season of Lent that are coming up. Uh, you'll see that you have Pastor Shannon here this morning instead of Shannon Hanley. Um, that is because uh, Shannon Hanley has been in the hospital this weekend with an infection, uh, but she's doing well and she hopes to be home soon. Uh, she will be updating you uh, with more details as she's ready to share them. So please just keep Shannon and Liam in your prayers. And then finally, I have a, a rather long announcement from our moderator, Teresa Beecham. Uh, she's been wanting to make this announcement for a while, so it has a lot of details in it. Uh, and so she's asked me to share them with you as Teresa's out of town this weekend. So not long ago, uh, this church received an opportunity in the form of a proposal. And that proposal came from Senior Neighbors and Gilda's Club of Lowell. For a variety of reasons, uh, those uh, organizations will be vacating their building this spring. And they wanted to explore the possibility of moving into our building. Uh, so because we are a community church involved in the community with lots of partnerships in the community, uh, that was something the leadership of this church began to explore and discovered that their proposal fits with our long history of sharing our building with groups. Our current partners, uh, as you probably know, are Lowell's Open Table, Lowell's Women's Club, uh, Laugh Fest, Lowell Pride, and Flow Fitness, which has Tai Chi classes here during the week. So um, in anticipation of another opportunity partner with this community and as a way to demonstrate God's endless hospitality and love for our neighbors, uh, many hours, at least 150 hours, have been poured in in the past few months to exploring the possibilities of this partnership and what it would take to make it a reality. So within the next few months, we will be welcoming senior neighbors and Gilda's Club into our building and creating space for them to continue the services that they provide in this community, in addition to allowing them room to grow. So they will use this building during times of the day when we are not use, using or underutilizing this space. And by opening our space to them, we hope to demonstrate our hospitality as good stewards over the use of this building and extending the extravagant hospitality of God to them. So as we prepared for this possibility, much thought, discussion, and research went into identifying the perceived needs of all parties in this partnership and how to make it a win-win. Part of the focus has been to create an accommodating and safe space for our new partners and their clients. It is with that in mind that uh, the church applied for three grants, and all of those grants have been received either partially or fully in order to make improvements to this property. First, uh, we've been approved for $10,500 from the Look Fund to provide keyless card entry and automatic door push pads for hands-free opening. 
These additions will enhance the security of our building and increase its accessibility to those who have limited mobility. From the Lowell Community Fund, we will receive $10,000 to go toward custom built 12 by 30 foot storage shed that's gonna be placed on the south side of the building just off the kitchen. This is for Senior Neighbors, Gildas Club, and for our church to use. The amount of this grant covered the majority of the cost of the building, but not all of it. So as such, the manufacturer has reduced the price by 18% and senior neighbors and the church have kicked in the remaining funds. The last grant approved is from the Lowell Cable TV Foundation for the amount of $27,150.54. This grant will allow us to add two sidewalks to straighten out the dog leg sidewalk on the north side of the building. Additionally, we will add a barrel shaped awning over the north sidewalk from the building to the parking lot, as well as add enhanced lighting to the family center out here. Altogether, we have been granted $47,650 for improvements to our building and grounds. As exciting as that is, the most exciting part is the opportunity for growth by means of this upcoming shared space partnership. Senior Neighbors and Gildas Club of Lowell will not only be able to continue their services to our community, but this expanded space will give them opportunities to grow in their services. It's an amazing opportunity for Lowell and we are so blessed that God has called us to be part of it. If you have any questions, you can speak with our moderator, Teresa Beecham, or our associate moderator, Roland Hawksbergen, who are both not here today, but you can shoot them a text or an email um, and they will be back around soon. Uh, for financial questions, you can see our treasurer, Dave Blakely. So I'll ask you now to rise as I give you God's greeting this morning as we open worship. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father who created you, from God the Son who has saved you, and from God the Holy Spirit who empowers and equips you for every good work in God's name. As God has greeted us with his peace this morning, let us pass that greeting to one another. season of Lent, where we are encouraging you to get out, do some things, sort of support the community in ways around different feeding ministries and different organizations in our community that, um, that support the basic needs of folks in our community who have less than. We house one of those. I don't know if you knew, but we have a feeding ministry right here within our four walls, open table. So the big focus for us this week is reminding you of all the different ways that you can reconnect with open table. We have needs for volunteers every single week. We are still feeding on average 100 people, 100 meals being served. And that's a lot, that's a lot of capacity. We are also back in person. So there is greater volunteer need in order to actually serve folks and kind of provide that restaurant feeling that good integrity uh, sort of mission that we're trying to provide. There's also donations. You can donate financially to support the cost of food is also a huge um, plus. And also the little free pantry. So if you can't give up your time on a Thursday, whether it be during the day on Thursday or Thursday night, you can also bring in staple pantry items here on Sunday mornings or on Thursdays and drop them at the little free pantry for open table patrons to take and help them sustain throughout the week. So in order to uh, convince you of why you should do one of these three things, I'm gonna have Brooke and Felix come on up and talk a little bit about their experience.
Good morning. So we are um, a definitely open table family in the summer as school year gets busy, but it's one of the best things that we do as a family. Um, it's kind of a way to go in and just help out in any way that you can. Um, whether you do dishes or you bus tables, take orders, any of those types of things, it's super easy, but the reward you see from the community makes it really a cool thing to do. Felix, what's your favorite thing about Open Table? Um, being my friend. Being your friend. How hard do you work at Open Table? Um, we just bus tables. You bus tables. What do you think you learn when you help out at Open Table? Um, I don't know. <laughs> do you think you learn how to um, share your talents with others? Yes. Yeah. Would you recommend others to go to Open Table and help volunteer? Yes. <laughs> so what we are asking is please just share that with others. Um, we, as a, I'm a Girl Scout leader of Lowell, so one of our troops is, um, that's our service unit project that we're working on for our troop. Um, so they need community service hours. So anything like that, any groups that you know, National Honor Society students, anything like that is always a good opportunity for them to get hours for their community service and also see and meet the needs of the community. Thank you. <laughs> Please now join me in our call to worship. <clears throat> oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. The hour is coming and is now here. In spirit and truth, let us worship God. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me now in singing our hymn of the month, 202. Does anyone know what this is for? What might I use this for? Okay, you can touch it, you can play with it, see if you can figure it out. Any ideas? Look, I even, there's even a hint inside of it at this exact moment. Okay, do you wanna see if you can, you know? 
Pam? Something to do with grape juice. Okay, you are warm. You are warm. Oh, is it to the, the right? Yes, yes, that's exactly what it's for. So I pour my juice in here, and then I can just release this little red lever. Boop. Oh, there's still some in there. Right? So we have ourselves a mess-free way to set up communion. So this is for communion. It's a nice little gadget. And I will tell you what. Anybody who's ever set up communion, Mrs. Blakely, Lori in the back, Rachel sometimes, communion can be a lot of work to set up. It's messy. I mean, we lose juice everywhere. It gets all over the counter oftentimes, okay? But then Mrs. Blakely introduced us to this nifty little gadget, and all of a sudden, we have so much help. It makes our life so much easier. Who knew this little hunk of plastic would be so helpful, right? But we have lots of these kinds of things that we use in our lives that help us, right? Think about glasses. Anybody who wears glasses wears them to help them see, right? Or hearing aids to help them hear. Or maybe people who are in a wheelchair or have to use crutches help them have some mobility, help them get around, right? I mean, think of a can opener. How many times in your life have you used a can opener? So many. Because how hard would it be to open a can without one? Right? Almost impossible. Yeah. So there's tons of things in our life that we use every single day because it just makes things easier. It's nice to have the help, right? So this morning, you're going to hear about a story between Jesus and a woman. And Jesus asks the woman for help. Specifically, he says, I am thirsty and I have some water. Because Jesus didn't have a jar. Jesus didn't have a way to get himself some water. But the woman did. So Jesus needed the woman's help. And I think it's pretty unusual for us to hear Jesus asking for help because a lot of times we're talking about how we ask Jesus for help, right? We pray to Jesus to ask for help. We, ask, we learn from others to help us learn how to be like Jesus. But we don't often think about how we help Jesus. We are called to be Jesus' helpers. Do you have any ideas maybe about how we could help Jesus? Any ideas? <laughs> yeah, there's one open table, right? So one idea that I had was if we see every single person, look around this congregation, if we see every single person as if they were Jesus, and we helped them, we're helping Jesus, right? So if we're attentive to people's needs, if we ask people, how can I help you? If we're kind to people and we don't cut them down and be mean to them, if we're nice to them, if we support them, if we show up and volunteer at Open Table, if we are at home and we say, Mom, how can I help? Is there any chores that I can do today, right? If we help others, we are helping Jesus, and we show care that way. Okay? So, every time you think about a gadget like this in your life, anytime you pull out that can opener or something else that helps you in any way, I want it to remind you that Jesus is asking for our help too. And oftentimes that means like just showing care to the people that we encounter every single day. Okay? All right, so let's take on an attitude of prayer and then you will head off into church school. Okay. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us as we try to help you. May we always be treating one another with kindness and to have a spirit of helpfulness in all that we do, so that more people would know that it is your love in and through us that allows us to be good people. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, we are going to read another long text out of the Gospel of John. This one comes immediately following the story that we heard last week about Nicodemus. So before we dive into this new text, though, I would like to try to jog your memory around 
what we read and what Pastor Shannon taught us about Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. And the way that he snuck out under the cover of night to meet Jesus and to challenge Jesus to explain things that weren't adding up to him. And the way that his intelligence led to some overthinking and unwillingness to suspend disbelief because he just didn't understand this Jesus. This morning we're going to read about a very different kind of encounter, the encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. These are intentionally parallel narratives because they are opposite ways for us to receive and interact with the truth that Jesus is providing. So I want you to be thinking as we hear this one this morning about how we as a congregation might take on the spirit of the Samaritan woman and how we nourish and nourish others and how we be nourished this Lenten season. So buckle in and hear these words from John chapter four. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying that I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you, you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when we, when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar. She went back to the city and she said to the people, come and see the man who told me everything that I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and they were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four more months, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around. See how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, One sows and another another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. 
And so many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of that woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. So let's begin by highlighting some of the primary differences. First, Nicodemus approached Jesus in the night so as to not be spotted fraternizing with the controversial Jesus. Whereas the Samaritan woman was approached by Jesus in the middle of the day. There was no secrecy around this interaction, even though it would have been very highly controversial. This was a bold move on Jesus' part. It crossed significant social boundaries based on religion, ethnicity, and gender. Jesus and this woman, a man and a woman, Jesus a Jew, the woman a Samaritan, a local and a traveler, both unmarried, and the woman with a questionable past. Jesus approaches her. Nicodemus approaches Jesus. Jesus had no shame. Nicodemus had lots. The second difference, Nicodemus was an insider. He was a religious teacher, a devout Jew, educated and intelligent. He was known in the community as a moral leader. He had earned respect and had been called by name by the writer. The woman, the complete opposite. We don't know her name. She is not religious. She is a Samaritan, an outsider. She knows nothing of this Jesus. She has not been educated on the morals and ethics of religion, and she practices an unconventional morality. I don't think this means we should assume that she lives on the margins, but she is definitely, by all accounts, a nobody. She is only identified by her gender, her religious orientation, her social standing, and her personal habits in the way that these things distance her from Jesus, and what Jesus represents. She is the antithesis to Nicodemus. But the third and perhaps most important difference between these two narratives is the response to what Jesus teaches them both about faith. Their reaction, once light has been introduced into their dark lives. Jesus gives them both essentially the same message about eternal life, about belief in God and the way that it now has the power to transform. And yet, their reactions couldn't be any more different. And so as we focus on nourishing ourselves and nourishing others with the good word that gives us new life, that difference is key. And so we're going to spend some time unpacking that a bit more. The woman at the well is doing her daily routine daily trips to the well for water, what she needs for the day. Only this time as she goes, she is approached by a stranger with a need that only she could meet in that moment. The stranger is thirsty. He has no bucket. He's been traveling and he needs help. She's the only one at the well. She has a jar, so he asks her for a drink. And then when she realizes what this stranger, a Jew of all things, is asking of her, she questions the social faux pas that the stranger is committing. Sure, it's just the two of them in the square right now, but social norms trumped all behavior at this time. And instead of offering an explanation for his boldness, he claims, actually, I can do you one better. I have water that will quench your thirst for life. 
living water. And so naturally she says, how on earth is your water any different or any better than this water? And here is where I want us to notice the first difference in her interaction with Jesus versus Nicodemus. Because rather than write off this ridiculous claim that this man has living water that will quench your thirst for life and that comes from somewhere above, instead she says, Sir, give me this water. And I think, my hypothesis, is that that is the moment where she knows who she's talking to. This is her first glimpse of the knowledge of God. Light has now been introduced to her dark world, even though she doesn't yet see it. Truth has been spoken to her, even though she has not yet discerned it. But she is ready. She is open. She is willing to hear what the stranger has to say. She finds herself now thirsty, wanting the water that only this stranger can provide. And so just like that, the tables of this interaction have turned. So Jesus is aware of her receptiveness, so he challenges her one step further. He lets her know that he knows her. He knows her circumstances. He knows her past. She, he knows that she has committed many social faux pas herself. And so she is shocked at what Jesus knows and that somehow she knew better than to lie to Jesus. She told a half-truth and Jesus calls her out. You are right in saying you have no husband, but in fact... And then she believes that she's in the presence of a prophet. She knows enough to know about the promise of the Messiah. But given her cultural background, she likely believes it would have any, any relevance to her at all. A coming Messiah was only going to save Jewish people. It was their God and their worship, not hers. So she doesn't quite equate this stranger in front of her with that promise. She only assumes that he is some kind of prophet. It wasn't until she leaves Jesus and her jug at the well to run and to go tell her community that there is someone in that town square who's claiming to be the Messiah or some kind of prophet or something. She says to her neighbors, come and see. And hear is when I believe she fully knows that she's been in the presence of God. And that this God, this Messiah, this stranger at the well, is in fact here for her. She says he cannot be the Messiah, can he? Jesus makes God known to this woman. And suddenly she, an outsider, a nobody, becomes a witness to the work that Jesus is doing in the world. She becomes an apostle. One final distinct difference between these two narratives is Jesus himself. With Nicodemus, Jesus is curt and impatient. He challenges his intellect almost with trick questions and confusing metaphors. And he is not amused with Nicodemus when it confirms his doubt. He mocks Nicodemus. With the woman at the well, Jesus is patient, kind even. He explains his metaphors to her without judgment and ridicule. He is gentle with her and is guiding her to the truth that he is the Messiah who supplies living water. So the conclusion to me is clear. There are two ways that we respond to the revelations of Jesus, the way that we receive the truth of Jesus Christ in our lives and the ways that we emulate Jesus in the way that we live and interact with one another. We can be open, open to go, to labor, to preach, and to expand the kingdom of God. Or we can be self-centered and we can wallow in our doubt pride ourselves on our intellect. So if we have to ask ourselves whose spirit it is that we should be taking on, you do not have to look any further than the way that Jesus responds to each to get your answer. 
We have all been both Nicodemus and the woman at the well at times. Pastor Shannon has already taught us about the times we might be in the spirit of Nicodemus and what we might do to refocus. So this morning we're going to talk about the spirit of the Samaritan woman. If you have ever felt like an outsider yourself, like a nobody, like you don't matter, unwelcome in any space, the woman at the well is for you. Jesus approaches you. Jesus sees you, knows you, is kind to you, and is unashamed of speaking to you, is offering you the life-giving, living water of the Spirit. Jesus' words are nourishment for you so that you like the Samaritan woman, can go and preach and gather laborers for the field so that all can continue to be nourished. The spirit of the woman is open. She is responsive to being known and quick to act as soon as the truth is revealed to her. She doesn't shy away from the impossibilities that she's encountered. And in turn, Jesus rewards her with kindness. And so if this is you today, know that Jesus is approaching you, waiting to offer you a sip of that holy water. She also serves to remind those of us who have been laboring in the field a while. Jesus has been inviting more and more laborers to join us in our work, and we should welcome them. The openness displayed between the Samaritan woman and Jesus is how we should be treating and welcoming one another in the work. Like the woman at the well, we were once outsiders. Even those of us who feel like we have been at this forever and we know everything, we have to remember that at one time, we were separated from Jesus in every way and brought to the fold ourselves through the taste of living water. We might be tired. We might be craving nourishment from the draining work that we're out here doing in the field. But might we be drinking water that is not satisfying our thirst? Might we be drinking the wrong kind of water? And so for us, the openness of the woman might look like accepting the living water being offered to us by the strangers among us. The ones that cross social norms the one that it would be shocking and controversial for us to be speaking to. The one who everybody else writes off as a nobody. We have at a time in our lives been an outsider, a nobody. We should be able to commemorate that. So it would behoove us to treat them the way that Jesus treated the woman at the well. The way Jesus has treated us they might actually be offering us the nourishment that we need rather than the other way around. Through her openness, Jesus saw this nobody and he turned her into one of his laborers harvesting the field. From outsider to apostle, this woman comes along the other laborers in the field. This is the beginning of Jesus expanding the field to include more and more people, outsiders, people who were not expected to be in the religious fold. And maybe some of the laborers were surprised to see her join them. To us, she may seem like a nobody, but Jesus makes it known that to God, she is a precious child. <coughs> And so maybe sometimes our tendencies can be like that of Nicodemus. Feeling like in order to get things right, we have to have everything aligned just so. In order to believe, we have to prove everything to be true. Or in order for something to be good, it has to make sense. And in order to feel belonging, somebody else must have to be excluded. But I think our preoccupation with those things could be the thing drying up our energies of working towards justice in the world. I think that becomes a distraction from the real mission that we are on. And the woman at the well is positioned immediately after Nicodemus and we are called out for being doubtful, distracted, self-centered, 
and to remind us to reapproach our faith with openness, humility, <coughs> and cautious hope. And to remember that whether we are nobodies, whether we are people with a past, or if we are new to the faith, our labor makes us apostles. Our work makes us participants in the work of justice that God is doing in the world. Our labor provides enough bread of life for all to be nourished abundantly. So this story is for you to receive with openness this morning. She teaches us what it means to nourish others and to be nourished. Two keys to our journey of faith. We are meant to see ourselves in this woman and to take on the spirit of being open, humble, and hopeful like she demonstrates. Through her conversation with Jesus, the woman moves slowly but intentionally from blindness to sight, ignorance to knowledge, misunderstanding to understanding, from darkness to light, from unbelief to faith. When we encounter Jesus, the same can be true for us. And like I taught the children this morning, Jesus comes to us in the form of one another. Jesus might come to us as a stranger seeking water or as a co-laborer for the mission or as plainly as the Messiah in our very midst. By way of those encounters, we might find ourselves nourishing a stranger or a trusted confidant in their journey towards belief. Or we might find ourselves being nourished by the spirit of truth at work within us. As outsiders turned apostles, may we feast confidently every time we encounter Jesus, knowing that that is all that we need to be nourished and to then be released to nourish others. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit, and we will say the words of our church's mission statement together. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. We will now remain standing, and we will turn to hymn number 247.
Let us go to our God in prayer. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, <coughs> sustainer of all things, you invite us like you did the woman at the well to be in a relationship with you. Like you, we are called to travel through places that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable to us. Like you, we can become tired from the journey. God, refresh us with the living water that you offer. Help us like you to ask for help when we need it. Empower us like you to cross boundaries in order to recognize your face in the humanity of others. God, while we often fail to recognize it, we know we are desperately in need of the living water that we can find only in you. God, forgive us for the ways that we have neglected to remember the stories of how you have worked in our world. While we have been busy asking, what would Jesus do, God, we have failed to ask, what are you already doing in our world? God, forgive us for our forgetfulness. Forgive us for our neglect. Quench our thirst that we might find life in you day after day after day. God, you know our pasts. You know our pain. You are familiar with our excuses, with the false binaries we've created, with our wandering. Yet you continually invite us into a relationship with you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. So God, today, we bring before you all the burdens that are heavy on our hearts for those suffering from illnesses, for those struggling with addictions, those struggling with poverty, with many named and unnamed burdens in their lives, God. We lift all of their pain before you with our own, and we place it into your capable hands, trusting and knowing that not only are you capable of meeting our needs, you also long to do so out of your love. Help us to recognize that. Empower us like the woman at the well to place our trust and our hope in you. Equip us to share the reason for our hope with others. And God, remind us that while we may not see the fruit of our labors, you are and will continue to be at work producing fruit in the lives of many. And so together we pray these words that you taught us to pray. Our God, who is in heaven, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now invite you to turn to the insert in your bulletin as we go through communion this morning. Just a few logistical notes before we get started. As a reminder here at First Congregational United Church of Christ of Lowell, we practice open communion, which means I invite each and every one of you to this table this morning and to use this time to meditatively reflect on the ways in which you have encountered Jesus this past week the ways you will encounter Jesus in this coming week, and the receptiveness to which you will have towards those encounters. We will encounter Jesus in the elements this morning, so may this be a shot at practice for us. Also this week, our elements come from 
a little bit of a Mexican tradition. So we have tortilla in the form of chips because that's what I could locate in my house this week. And we have Jamaica, which is a sweet fruit drink. So please enjoy those. We do have a gluten-free option available if you need that. Um, if you would prefer to stay seated and have the elements brought to you for any reason, we can also do that. But I would have folks come forward, grab your elements, return to your seat, use the time as you see fit, partake in the elements on your own time as Deborah plays for us. would also invite you to bring your offerings forward as well, and we will close this time of communion with the doxology and prayer and praise, and then we will pray the prayer of dedication. So invite you to follow along with me in the communion insert. Please let us pray. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your <coughs> church that you have gathered. So now, with your children of faith in all places and times, we praise you with joy. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O oh God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, on the eve of his death, Jesus gathered the disciples for a feast of Passover. Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you partake, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way also the cup, after they had eaten, Jesus took it and said, This cup is my blessing poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ's death, O oh God, we proclaim. Christ's resurrection, we declare. Christ's coming, we await. Glory be to you, O oh God. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection, and awaiting Christ's return in victory. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives committed to your service in behalf of all people. So we ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and wine, on, these, on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout all of our lives, that we may know you as the Holy One, who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives forever. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is now ready.
Let us pray together. O Lord, you are our God. We are the people of your pasture, the sheep of your hand. As you have fed us by your mercy, may it be our daily bread to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now sing together, turning to hymn number 76, sent forth by God's blessing. our common commission together. Final announcement as we depart that I forgot to make. There is a table uh, in the back with uh, strips of cloth on it. Uh, we will be writing prayers on those strips of cloth uh, throughout the Lenten season, so I invite you, if you haven't already, to write a prayer on a cloth there, and they will be used in a special way for Easter Sunday, but your prayers are between you and God, so write what you feel led to write. As we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you, May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious toward you. May the Lord's face turn toward you again and again and again and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.